Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Astara and Lily. And we are tonight going to read The Republic by Plato. We're on chapter, I mean book five. We get there. Good heavens, my dear friend. I said, what consummate skill will our rulers need if the same principle holds of the human species? Certainly the same principle holds, but why does this involve any particular skill? Because I said our rulers will often have to practice upon the body corporate with medicines. Now you know that when patients do not require medicines, but have only to be put under a regimen, the inferior sort of practitioner is deemed to be good enough. But when medicine has to be given, then the doctor should be more of a man. That is quite true, he said. But to what are you alluding? I mean, I replied that our rulers will find a considerable dose of falsehood and deceit for the good of their subjects. We were saying that the use of all these things regarded as medicines might be of advantage. And we were very right. And this lawful use of them seems likely to be often needed in the regulations of marriages and births. How so? Why, I said, the principle has been already laid down that the best of either sex should be united with the best as often and the inferior with the inferior seldom as possible, and that they should rear the offspring of the, sort, of the one sort of union, but not of the other. But the flock is to be maintained in first-rate condition. Now these goings-on must be a secret which the rulers only know, or there will be a further danger of our herd. As the guardians may return, breaking out into rebellion. Very true. Had we better not appoint certain festivals at which we will bring together the brides and bridegrooms and sacrifices will be offered in suitable wedding songs composed by our poets? The number of weddings is a ma matter which must be left to the discretion of the rulers, whose aim will be to preserve the average of population. There are many other things which they will have to consider, such as the effects of wars and diseases and any similar agencies in order as far as this is possible to prevent the state from becoming either too large or too small. Certainly, he replied. We shall have to invent some ingenious kind of lots which the less worthy may draw on each occasion without bringing them together, and they will accuse their own ill luck and not the rulers. And then they will accuse their own ill luck and not the rulers. To be sure, he said. And I think that our braver and better youth, besides their other honors and rewards, might have greater faculties of intercourse with women given them. Their bravery will be a reason, and such fathers ought to have as many sons as possible. And the proper officers, with whether male or female, or both, for offices are to be held, offices are, be, are to be held by women as well as by men. Yes, the proper officers will take the offspring of the good parents to the parent fold, and there they will deposit them with certain nurses who dwell in a separate quarter. But the offspring of the inferior of the better, when they chance to be deformed, will be put away in some mysterious, unknown place as they should be. Yes, he said, that must be done if the breed of the guardians is to be kept pure. They will provide for their nurturing, and bring the mothers to the fold when they are full of milk, taking the greatest possible care that no mother recognizes her own child and other wet nurses may be engaged if more are required. Care will also be taken that the process of suckling shall not be pro protracted too long, and the mothers will have no getting up at night or other trouble, but will hand over all this sort of thing to the nurses and attendants. You suppose the wives of our guardians to have a fine, easy time of it when they are having children? Why, said I, and so they ought. Let us, however, proceed with our scheme. You were saying that the parents should be in the prime of life. Very true. And what is the prime of life? May it not be defined as a period of about 20 years in a woman's life and 30 years in a man's? Which years do you mean to include? A woman, I said, 
20 years of age, you may begin to bear children to the state and continue to bear them until 40. A man may begin at 25 when he has passed the point of, at which the pulse of life beats quickest and continue to beget children until he is be 55. Certainly, he said, both in men and women, those years are the prime of physical as well as of intellectual vigor. Anyone above or below the prescribed ages who takes part in the public hymenal shall be said to have done an unholy and unrighteous thing. The child of which she is the father, if it steals it into life, will have been conceived under auspices very unlike the sacrifices and prayers which at each hymenial priestess and priests and the whole city will offer that the new generation may be better and more useful than their good and useful parents. Whereas this ch child will be the offspring of a dark and strange lust. Very true, he said, replied. The same law will apply to any of those within the prescribed age who forms a connection with any woman in the prime of life without the sanction of the rulers. For we shall say that he is raising up a bastard to the state, uncertified and unconsecrated. Very true, he replied. This applies, however, only to those who are within the spe specified age. After that, we will allow them to range it up at will, except that a man may not marry his daughter or his daughter's daughter, his mother or his mother's mother, and women, on the other hand, are prohibited from marrying their sons or fathers, or son's son or father's father, and so on in either direction. And we grant all this accompanying permission will st with strict orders to prevent any embryo which may come into from being from seeing the light, and if any force away to the birth, the parents must understand that the offspring of such a union cannot be maintained and arranged accordingly. That also, he said, is a reasonable pr proposition, but how will they know who are fathers and daughters and so on? They will never know. The, the way will be this, dating from the day of the hymenal. The bridegroom who was then married will call all the male children who are born in the seventh and the tenth month afterward his sons, and the female children his daughters, and they will call him father, and he will call their children his grandchildren, and they will call the elder generation grandfathers and grandmothers, all who were begotten at the, at the time when their fathers and mothers came together will be called their brothers and sisters. And these, as I was saying, will be forbidden to intermarry. This, however, is not to be understood as an absolute pro prohibition of the marriage of brothers and sisters if the lot favors them and they receive the sanction of the Pythian or oracle the law will allow them. Quite right, he replied. Such is the scheme, Glaucon, according to which the guardians of our state are to have their wives and families in common. And now you would have the argument show that this community is consistent with the rest of our po polity, and also that nothing can be better, would you not? Yes, certainly. Shall we try to find a common basis by asking of ourselves what ought to be the chief aim a legislator in making laws and an organization of a state? What is the greatest good and what is the greatest evil? And then consider whether our previous description has the stamp of the good of, of the evil. By all means, can there be any greater evil than discord and distraction and plurality where unity ought to reign, or any greater good than the bond of unity? There cannot. And there's unity where there's community of pleasures and pains where all the citizens are glad or grieved on the same occasions of joy and sorrow, no doubt. Yes, and where there's no common but only private feeling, a state is disorganized. When you have one half of the world triumphing and the other plunged in grief at the same events happening to the city or the citizens, certainly. Such differences commonly originate in a disagreement about the use of the terms mine and not mine, his and not his. Exactly so. And is not that the best ordered state in which the greatest number of persons apply the term mine and not mine in the same way to the same thing? Quite true. 
on that again which most nearly approaches to the conditions of the individual as in the body when but a finger of one of us is the hurt the whole frame drawn, drawn toward the soul as a center and forming one kingdom under the ruling power therein feels the hurt and sympathizes all together with the part affected and we say that the man has a pain in his finger the same expression is used about any other part of the body which is a senseless excuse me as a sensation of pain at suffering or a pleasure at the alleviation of suffering very true he replied and i agree with you that in the best best ordered state there is the nearest approach to this common feeling which you describe then when any uh, one of the citizens experiences any good or evil the whole state will make his case their own and will either rejoice or sorrow with him yes he said that is what will happen in a well-ordered state it will now be time i said for us to return to our state and see whether this or some other form is most in accordance with these fundamental principles very good our state like every other has rulers and subjects true all of whom will call one another citizens of course but is there not another name which people give to their rulers in other states generally they call them masters but in democratic states they simply call them rulers and in our state, what other name besides that of citizens do the people give the rulers? They are called saviors and helpers, he replied. And what do the rulers call the people? They're maintainers and foster fathers. And what do they call them in other states? Slaves. What do the rule, rulers call one another in other, in other states? Fellow rulers. And what in ours? Fellow guardians. Did you ever know an example in any other state of a ruler would speak of one of his colleagues as his friend and another as not being his friend. Yes, very often. And the friend he regards and describes as one in whom he has an interest, and the other as a stranger in whom he has no interest. Exactly. But would any of your guardians think or speak of any other guardian as a stranger? Certainly he would not. For everyone whom they meet will be regarded by them either as a brother or sister or father or mother, with son or daughter, or as the child or parent of those who are thus connected with him. Capital, I said, but let me ask you once more. Shall they be a family in name only, or shall they in all their actions be true to the name? For example, in the use of the word father, will the care of a father be implied in the filial reverence and duty and obedience to him, which the law commands, and is the violator of these duties to be regarded is an impious and unrighteous person who is not likely to receive such much good either at the hands of God or of man. Are these to be or not to be the strains which the children will hear repeated in their ears by all the citizens about whose who are intimated to let to them to be their parents and the rest of their kinsfolk? These, he said, and none other, for what can be more ridiculous than for them to utter the names of family ties with the lips only and not to act in the spirit of them. Then in our city, the language of harmony and con concord will be more often heard than in any other. As I was describing before, when anyone is, is well or ill, the universal word will be with me, it is well or it is ill. Most true. And agreeably to this mode of thinking and speaking, were we not saying that they will have their pleasure and pains in common? Yes, and so they will. And they will have a common interest in the same thing which they will alike call my own. And having this common interest, they will have a common feeling of pleasure and pain. Yes, far more so than in other states. And the reason of this, over and over, over and above the general constitution of the state will be that the guardians will have a community of women and children that will be the chief reason and this unity of feeling we admitted to be the greatest good as was implied in our comparison of a well-ordered state to the uh, to the relation of the body and the members when affected by pleasure or pain that we acknowledge and very rightly then the community of wives and children among our citizens 
is clearly the source of the greatest good to the state, certainly. And this agrees with the other principle which we were affirming, that the guardians were not to have houses or lands or any other property. Their pay was to be their food, which they were to receive from the other citizens, and they were to have no private expenses, for we intended them to preserve their true character of guardians. Righty replied, <coughs> Both the community of property and the community, community of families, as I am saying, tend to make them more truly guardians. They will not tear the city in pieces by differing about mine, and not mine, each man dragging any acquisition which he has made into a separate house of his own, where he has a separate wife and children, and private pleasures and pains, but all will be affected as far as may be by the same pleasures and pains, because they are all of one opinion about what is near and dear to them, and therefore they all tend toward a common end. Certainly, he replied, and as they have nothing but their persons which they can call their own suits and complaints will have no existence among them. They will be delivered from all these quarrels of which money or children or relations are the occasion. Of course they will. Neither will trials for assault or insult ever be likely to occur among them. For that equals should defend themselves against equals we shall maintain be honorable and right, we shall compel them to care for their, own, their bodies. That is good, he said. Yes, and there is a further good in the law, viz. that if a man has a quarrel with another, he will satisfy his resentment then and there and not proceed to more dangerous lengths. Certainly, to the elder shall be decide, assigned the duty of ruling and chastising the younger. Clearly, nor can there be a doubt that the younger will not strike or do any other violence to an elder unless the magistrates command him, nor will he slight him in any way. For there are two guardians, shame and fear, mighty prevent to prevent him, shame which makes men refrain from laying hands on those, that are to, those who are to them in the relation parents fear that the injured one will be succored by the other whose others who are his brothers, sons, fathers. That is true, he replied. Then in every way the laws will help the citizens to keep the peace with one another. Yes, there will be no want of peace. And as the guardians will be never quarrel among themselves, there will be no danger of the rest of the city being divided either against them or against one another. None whatever. And I'm going to end right there tonight. And we should be able to finish up book five. Another tree here. It's like another 13 pages. So we should be able to finish up book five and then we'll be doing the summary of book five in the well, next couple of videos. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below. And hit the notification bell and stay tuned for more from Mustara and Lily.